This episode of Death Battle is sponsored by Bespoke Post and Shady Rays. Sauron, the Lord of the Rings. The Lich King, Warcraft's Lord of the Scourge. Evil has many shapes, but few can match the presence of these kings of blight and shadow. He's whiz and I'm boomstick. And it's our job to analyze their weapons, armor, and skills to find out who would win a death battle. Within the timeless halls, at the dawn of creation, the supreme god Eru and his angelic Ainur created all of existence through a single harmonious song. But one of these angels just had to be a rebel. Melkor ruined that harmony, giving the world its many, many imperfections, like Wiz. Then after messing up God's hit single and going rogue, Melkor took up a new name just to be even more meddled, Morgoth. Morgoth's power was impressive, daunting. Several Maiar, essentially lower ranked angels, joined him in his frightening conquest of the world he had helped create. And the greatest of these followers was one obsessed with destroying all life in the pursuit of bringing about complete order. He used to be Myron, but under Morgoth's reign, he became the one and only Sauron. As the big wig of Morgoth's forces, Sauron spent thousands of years bringing Middle-earth to its knees. He's almost more a force of nature than anything else, able to create infernos, cause country-spanning earthquakes, and even absorb souls. And because he's a weird angel spirit man, he can morph his body around his own soul however he wants, or just shed it like clothing and fight as a ghost! He can morph far beyond that. He has appeared as something akin to both man and elf, attractive and devious, a werewolf once thought to be the greatest wolf of all, and even a vampire. Oh man, Tumblr's gonna go nuts with that. Many of his greatest accomplishments are not due to his powerful magics and weaponry, but his inhuman cunning. Sauron is nothing less than a master of manipulation. He's like if Loki and Satan did a fusion dance. He loves to trick someone with illusions, shadow magic, or just by toying with their sad, predictable, pathetic human emotions. Like when he convinced Saruman to join the evil side, who was basically a super wizard specifically meant to lead the charge against Sauron. In some ways, Sauron is actually wiser than the master he served. In the most epic war to eclipse all other wars, humans, dwarves, elves, and more united to destroy Morgoth, casting what remained of Melkor into the void. But Sauron saw it coming and bailed faster than me at a divorce hearing, just to show back up centuries later in the fiery pits of Mordor. There, the Dark Lord created a plan to conquer everything. He fooled the elven smiths into forging 19 rings of power and planted them among the leaders of elven, man, and dwarven kind, all controlled by another ring he made in secret. The one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Oh God, that's so epic. Think I'm into poetry now. Forged in the fires of Mount Doom using part of Sauron's own soul, the One Ring amplified his power and let him control the minds and actions of the other ring bearers. The nine kings of men were especially vulnerable and saw themselves reduced to twisted wraiths bent to Sauron's whims. It wasn't any better for the less kingly humans, so much so that Sauron mind controlled most of Numenor. We're talking about an island nation that could have had as many as 18 million people, and Sauron had them all at his creepy, pokey fingertips. This led to retaliation from Eru, who had hardly directly intervened ever before, even against Morgoth. Eru sank Numenor while Sauron was still on it, but the Dark Lord spirit persevered, indestructible even against the wrath of God. Sauron used the ring to build himself a new body. It may have cost a lot of power, but he took a biblical event to the face and went right back on to being evil. And yet, putting so much power into one object did have drawbacks. Which hit back hard when Isildur subtracted a digit from his hand. The Warrior King did more than just cut off a finger. He took the ring and its power for himself. This act forced Sauron to retreat as a disembodied spirit threatened by his own power in the hands of another. And should the One Ring be destroyed completely, Sauron's spirit could be rendered impotent beyond repair. It isn't all bad, though. The Ring can turn you invisible, create visions of impending doom, and has one hell of a defense mechanism. Yeah, who'd want to destroy it when it makes you want it? As a 
will of its own, with promises whispered, even the best of us can't refuse. The greatest poultry dinner ever, Boomstick. Bourbon, pecan, parmesan, turducken. It's so precious. What did you just do? What? It sounded delicious. Well, ring or no ring, Sauron's a beast. He's swatted away armies of soldiers, interrupted Mount Doom through sheer willpower. He has total control over his own being and can modify his soul at will. So he can definitely resist someone like spooky ghost Celebrimbor trying to dominate his spirit. And being among the strongest Maiar, the peak of Sauron's power is beyond that of Osei, a lesser Maya, which is specifically important because Osei single-handedly raised the island of Numenor. Yeah, remember that island that got Noah? That place. No wonder everyone wants his ring. Who could turn down that much power? Not as Sildor. The hearts of men are easily corrupted, and he kept the ring rather than destroy it. But in the end, the ring destroyed him and waited for its master's return. Sauron was rebuilding Mordor into a world-conquering force. And after a little bit of good old-fashioned torture, he found out the ring was in the Shire. The chillest, coziest, dopest place imaginable. Ah oh, man, when I retire, I'm gonna go live in a hobbit hole and just get lit 24-7. And so began the War of the Ring. Sauron's forces covered the land, seeking both the ring and the downfall of man always shadowed by the symbol of his ever-present influence, the Eye of Sauron. It was a slaughter fest. Middle Earth stood no chance. Everybody basically accepted death by orcs as inevitable. It was hopeless. The kingdoms of men would finally fall for good. Save for the Dark Lord's truest weakness. Sauron's cunning and stratagems were impressive, sure, but ultimately, he never truly understood the people of Middle Earth. In his mind, absolute power was factually irresistible. He never imagined a mere mortal could ever or would ever seek to actually destroy the One Ring. Against all odds and a whole lot of walking, Sauron was defeated. Not by the sparkly new king or the armies of Middle Earth, but by the most unlikely creature imaginable, Elijah Wood. Yet, even as a formless shadow, Sauron's legacy remains one of domination, treachery, and most of all, Fear, fitting for the being that represents, and I quote, as near an approach to the holy evil will as is possible. This episode of Death Battle is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Gear up for fall with Bespoke Post and their new seasonal lineup of must-have box of awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. Like the hot sauces in the Scorch Box combined from brands all across the country, perfect for some deliciously devilish home cooking. No matter what you have going on this season, Box of Awesome has you covered. From camping gear essentials to travel must-haves and autumn cocktail kits, Box of Awesome has everything you need for fall. I'm personally digging all the sick knives in boxes like Terra, Forge, and River. Each box is valued at about $70, but you'll only be paying a fraction of that. It's totally free to sign up too, and you can skip a month or cancel any time, no sweat. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code DEATHBATTLE at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com code DEATHBATTLE for 20% off your first box. boxofawesome.com code DEATHBATTLE. On the distant planet of Draenor, destruction was imminent. The orc shaman Ner'zhul prepared a spell with his followers to tear the planet asunder, all to escape the fury of the demon lord, Kill Jaden. But when Ner'zhul waltzed through the portal, Kill Jaden was right there waiting for him. Ner'zhul was forced to serve Kill Jaden's will to ravage another world, Azeroth. Thus, he was transformed into the first Lich King. This Lord of the Dead was sent to the continent of Northrend, but Kil'jaeden had one more twist for poor Zul. His body was gone, leaving just his spirit, which was bound to a set of armor sealed within a prison of magical ice. Man, this guy can't catch a break. Armor looks sick, though. He's gonna possess me if I put that on, huh? From his frozen prison, the Lich King would begin his conquest, conjuring an unstoppable plague of undeath. Soon, this would threaten the lives of the kingdom of Lordaeron. Okay, so that was a lot, but here's where our main guy finally shows up. Lordaeron's crown prince and holy knight, Arthas Menethil. 
Yes, name does kind of sound like something your doctor would give you for fungus, but hey, no, 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 Arthas was a badass. At 19 years old, he was considered one of the best swordsmen in the world and had mastered nearly every weapon he could. Even with such a skilled warrior as its prince, Lord Aran was already severely pressured by a war with an orcish horde, so a zombie plague was the last thing Arthas needed. Compounding this even further, Nerzul managed to break free of Kil'jaeden's power and turned his attention toward creating a champion to lead his ever-growing scourge. Naturally, he chose Arthas. Who was a stressed out mess, to the point where he tried to stop the plague by killing everyone in his own city. Holy shit! Yeah, he was totally losing it, so hearing a creepy voice in his head really didn't help. Long story short, in his efforts to protect his realm, Arthas discovered a rune blade and took it for himself. This was the fearsome Frostmourne. Surprise! It's the source of the Lich King's power. He was stealing souls and storing them within the blade. With this new ice-cold cleaver in hand, Arthas lost his soul and got a Death Knight makeover. And so the former Hero of Light would lead the very scourge he previously fought. And in time, Arthas would don the armor for himself, giving the Lich King a new ultimate power. WALKING! Remember, everything the Lich King had done up until this point had been from his prison within a literal block of ice. And this new Saranite armor, wait, no, Saranite armor is the best! Like, what was it doing stuck in ice all this time when it's made of old god blood and self-repairs? Screw you, blacksmith! You're never taking my hard-earned gold! I'll never have to get naked and die again! By donning this dark helm, Nerzul and Arthas fused to become one a being far more powerful than either had been before. He could effortlessly cover cities in ice storms, murder hundreds with the power of shadow, and learn all of your secrets with the eye of Acherus. Azeroth's fate was sealed. Everyone was doomed. See this guy? He's Illidan, a 15,000 year old demon hunter with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. As a death knight, Arthas could take him down, even after fighting through a massive army to get to him. Against this new Lich King? Illidan never stood a chance. This is important because Illidan had absorbed the power of Gul'dan, an orc warlock who, alongside his followers, raised the Broken Isles out of the sea, a massively powerful feat of magic. The fact that Arthas, a mortal guy, beat him up is a big deal. Just imagine how kick-ass he'd be in full control of the undying Lich King powers. Oh wait, we don't have to. Nerzul may have pulled Arthas' strings up until this point, but he had made a drastic miscalculation. Within the mind of the Lich King, Arthas battled Nerzul for control and won. The power of Frostmourne, of the Scourge, of Undeath itself was now under the command of Arthas. And by this point, he was just done. Like, with everything. We've all had one of those days, right? Where you see all of humanity is so pathetic they can only be saved by just killing them all so you rip out your own heart. Yeah, relatable. Determined to end all life, Arthas led his scourge across Azeroth, spreading the plague to every corner of the world. He slaughtered every contender in his path, including legendary champions like this hero of the Horde, Dranosh Sarfang. Who the Lich King bitch slapped to death in one hit, then zombified to serve him instead. Man, that didn't go well. The Lich King seemed unstoppable. Only one thing could take him down. A 25-man raid team of the best nerds World of Warcraft servers had to offer. And that one guy who was just there because he was friends with somebody, but damn he sucked. With these, uh, heroes triumphant, the Paladin Tyrion shattered Frostmourne with an equally legendary blade, ending the Lich King's vile reign. But the Scourge doesn't work on Phantom Menace battle droid rules, so there must always be a Lich King to keep the relentless undead in check. Yet no Lich King before or since ever matched the terror and malice Arthas brought to Azeroth. Without a doubt, one of the most terrifying kings to ever conquer the world of Warcraft. This episode of Death Battle is sponsored by Shady Rays. Are you looking for an industry-best combination of fit, style, and performance without the big brand price tag? Shady Rays has got all of that to make your perfect summer complete. It's not just quality. Every pair of Shady Rays is backed by lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they'll send you a brand new pair. 
Wear them without fear because Shady Rays has your back long after you purchase. And with every order, they provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America. That's over 20 million meals to date. You get to look good with your shades and feel good by making an impact. If you don't love them, exchange for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop with Shady Rays. Exclusively for our viewers, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code DEATHBATTLE for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 200,000 people. All right, the combatants are set. We've run the data through all possibilities. It's time for an undeath battle! wasn't all powerful before. Look out for supercharged Sauron now. Despite the Lich King's impressive power, Sauron's might was absolute. But not before he got the duel of his life in a crazy close bout. First up, both Dark Lords could counter pretty much any mind or soul screwing powers, making a lot of their usual tricks way less noteworthy in this match. To be fair, the Lich King severely debilitated Sauron via his plague of undeath. Most physical bodies would not survive such a disease. So Sauron just got rid of his body. Who needs it? Especially when you can rebuild one or just start fighting as a ghost. 
about things Sauron could do. After all, the plague is intended for organic mortal enemies and has never infected a spirit. Another smaller point for Sauron was his weakness. The Lich King was a clever bastard, but even with the Eye of Acherus, it would have been tough for him to decode and destroy the One Ring. Meanwhile, given enough power, Sauron would naturally end up destroying Frostmourne. He's kinda got a thing for breaking swords. So let's compare their power. While their highest limits are certainly nebulous, interestingly enough, some of the most impressive feats from both worlds involve lifting islands. As Sauron is a more powerful Maya than Osei, and the Lich King could reliably defeat someone with Gul'dan's magic, it is possible to gauge the difference in power by measuring the islands that were raised. Keep in mind, Gul'dan had a bunch of help, so we're only giving him his share. Turns out, Osei was doing twice the work! By examining official maps to determine the volume of the islands, we found a difference between lifting two quadrillion tons of rock versus four quadrillion tons, among further energy required to actually lift these through the ocean, of course. Both impressive, sure, but Sauron had the edge. And for the final nail in the coffin, the Lich King might have been super scary, but he really wasn't around for all that long, at least not when compared to the experience Sauron has warring with the world for thousands of years. The Lich King certainly posed a threat to Sauron, but the ruler of Mordor's awesome might, enduring spirit, and millennia of treachery proved him the superior Dark Lord. Wow! Is that... is that it? What? Are you Sauron the pun? I was pretty Tolkien about it. The winner is Sauron. Hey, if you want more Death Metal ASAP, why not grab a membership? You'll get exclusive emotes, badges, live chat, live streams, and a bunch of behind the scenes stuff. Just click that join button. Thanks for watching.